Welcome to Innovation and Wealth Presents Toolkit Tuesday. I'm Mickey Campo, I'm Director of Community Growth here at Innovation Guelph, and I'm so pleased to be hosting this call with all of you here today. Uh, I'd like to first welcome our two friendly American Sign Language interpreters whose time today is graciously provided in kind by the Sign Language Interpreting Associates of Ottawa, Samantha and Shelley. So thank you both for joining us, and thank you to Cleo for uh, having you come and, and be with us here today. Uh, while I'm here, I would also like to thank our corporate sponsors, Ernst & Young, Reese Informatica, Invest in Wealth, and BDO. We're very grateful for their support in everything we do. I would also like to give some recognition to the land that Guelph is on. We acknowledge that many others here today may be on different territories, so we invite and encourage each of you to give recognition to the land that you are on uh, here today uh, and every day. As we gather for today's event, we are reminded that Guelph is situated on treaty land that is steeped in rich Indigenous history and home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people today. As a city, as a company in Guelph, we have a responsibility for the stewardship of this land on which we live and work. And today, we acknowledge the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation of Anishinaabek peoples on whose traditional territory we are meeting. So, in case some of you are new to Innovation Guelph, uh, I'll give you a quick background. Uh, Innovation Guelph is one of 17 regional innovation centers in Ontario. And while we're located in Guelph, we actually serve the entire region of Southern Ontario and have some national programs as well. So we have clients throughout Guelph, our surrounding area, and all the way from BC to Nova Scotia and many provinces and territories in between. We do work with our clients supporting them through multiple stages of business growth, from startup to scale up with lots of programs and mentorship, workshops, networking opportunities, trade shows, um, and we have a lot of different things happening uh, to help companies grow and scale, uh, no matter what industry they are in. Uh, but right now, enough about us. You're here to listen to Leo, so I'll give you a quick update on who Leo is, and then I will hand things over to him. So without further ado, I would like to introduce today's expert presenter, Leo Chan. Uh, sought, off, sought after by major companies with over 20 years of experience in innovation and creativity, Leo has inspired and coached innovators with his magical ability to unleash innovation ideas and practices that guide leaders to stay ahead of competition. Leo understands that a culture that empowers and trains its innovators can create a thriving atmosphere for dynamic work with potential impact. Should you have any questions for Leo today during the presentation, you can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and Shauna will monitor and ask your questions when the right moment appears during the presentation. Um, I believe Leo even has some polls for you today, so he'll be asking you to get involved. We would love for you to be able to participate in those as they come up. At the end of the session today, there'll be an organized question and answer period, uh, and you'll be able to ask those questions live if, if you wish. So, enough from me. Um, welcome, Leo. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm going to hand things over to you. Take All care. right. Thanks, Mickey. Hey, everybody. Thanks, Innovation Guelph, for having me today. Uh, I'm super excited to speak to you about Innovation Foundation. So let me share my screen. So make sure this is all good. Okay. Can everybody see my screen? Beautiful. All right. All righty. So let's get going. This is a wonderful topic uh, today to talk about what innovation is all about, because I think it's kind of like a, a bit of a mystery out there. And so today I'm hoping to demystify what this is who it's for, all the things. So let's get rolling. All right, so you already saw about me. <laughs> all I want you to know is that I do Lego Serious Play, and it's one of the most powerful business tools that you may have never heard about. It is not a child's toy. It can be used for business. I'm like trying to pique your curiosity because it's actually my favorite uh, methodology on the planet. All righty, so in terms of housekeeping, as Mickey pointed out, I am hoping that you will participate and engage today. Uh, and so I will actually ask you to 
say things, post things, there's going to be some polls, but I'd love to know from you how this is tracking. So please do engage. There'll be little icons on the screen that'll kind of sort of show you what I'm hoping for, but please do. I, I think this is better for your learning uh, if you do engage with the content. Okay, so let's get going. I'm going to ask you a series of questions as we roll into this presentation. So are you ready for the future? Are you prepared for the future? Does the future just happen? Or can you do something about it? The best way to prepare for the future is to create it. Now, let me ask you this. Were you prepared for the global pandemic? So it's a trick question. Don't worry, nobody was. <laughs> However, there were companies who were prepared because they created the future. And I'm going to give you a quick example. I used to work at Chick-fil-A corporate in Atlanta, Georgia. And in 2019, the year before the pandemic, they started to explore third-party delivery options. So before uh, Uber Eats and DoorDash became like a really big thing, they started to explore these third-party delivery options as a new way of convenience for the customers. And so in 2019, they figured that this would be a thing. And so they embarked down the road. They started making all the relationships with these organizations, all the legal contracts, yada, yada, yada. And so they really started to double down on making this a reality in a small scale. And when the pandemic hit, uh, the restaurant industry was severely impacted, right? So if you remember in March, 2020, you know, restaurants were pretty much all closed. And so a significant portion of revenue essentially was, was eliminated. But because Chick-fil-A had started down this road of third-party options, all the organization had to do was double down on the efforts that they had already begun. So instead of now just going from a, you know, a small market test, they, they started thinking about how do we roll this thing out nationwide. If Chick-fil-A did not prepare the year before, they would have had a lot more work to do. And I don't think they would have been able to scale it as quickly as they did. And so because they had already started thought about creating the future of the year prior when the pandemic hit, and a situation completely changed everything, they were able to pivot and go with it. And so what the pandemic showed all of us is that really anything can happen. Anything can happen. And more than before, we need innovation because we do not know what will happen in the future. So I'm going to say it again. The best way to prepare for the future is to create it. And it's innovation that helps you create that new future. Okay, so hopefully I got you a little bit uh, hooked. Uh, this is why we need this innovation uh, so much, but here's the journey that we're gonna take. So we're gonna talk about what is innovation, why it's needed, what do innovators do, who can innovate, challenges to innovation, and then I'm gonna give you a how-to, so a, a high-level overview of a process. I can't go super deep into it, but just kind of introduce to you how you can innovate, and I'm gonna give you a tool that you can utilize uh, after the webinar today. So I'd love for you to know, so Shauna, if you can put on the poll, I'd love to know what your current knowledge of innovation is. There's only three things I'm curious about. Are you a beginner? Would you say I'm new to this thing? Uh, intermediate or advanced? How would you say your current knowledge of innovation is today? There's no right or wrong here. We all start from somewhere. So we have most people participating. Shauna, do you want to share the results? All right. So looks like we have a good mix. A lot of people will say intermediate, uh, about 50, half of you, uh, some, some beginners and some advanced. So great. Uh, hopefully... I think innovation is such an interesting world because there's all different ways we can approach it. So even if you're in the maybe intermediate and advanced way, maybe there's new things that you'll consider about innovation today. But thanks for joining uh, and thanks for participating. All right. So my next question for you is, what is innovation anyway? So in the chat, I'd love for you to type in what you think this word means. What is innovation to you? What do you think innovation is? Kieran says new. Creating something new, a new solution, says Sandra. Yeah. Chris says creating ideas that solve problems. Trish, a new approach to solving a problem. 
uh, Yaha creating new solutions to old problems. Kieran says disrupting the industry. So we're seeing a little bit of a theme here, something about newness, uh, fixing old things. Uh, so, okay, Richard says pushing back. This is great. So I'd like to share with you what my definition is of innovation. And it's simply, you may have got it from before, but it's creating a new future. And we do that by transforming ideas into value. So there's a little bit of, uh, let me unpack this for you a little bit. But first, creating a new future means that you can see a alternate possibility of what's coming. So I like to say that the future is coming whether we want it or not. And so we can either like that future or maybe we can think about a different way to do something. And so when we innovate, it's actually seeing a new possibility and bringing that into reality. And so the things in the parentheses by transforming those ideas that we have into value. So we have to take the what we see, these new ideas that we have and turn it into value and value is not something that has to be only financial it just means that it it has a a meaning to somebody else you know in the case of business it's a business value so maybe it looks like customer loyalty or customer retention um, even if you change the process and made it more efficient that's still turning something into value because now you've gained back time uh, and all sorts of things so really it's around seeing a new possibility making that into a reality, turning it into something that has a tangible, valuable uh, value to the business or to yourself. And so the way you do this all is through the innovation process. There's a process to actually innovate. And I like to say that the innovation process is an iterative learning process to problem solving when the way forward is unknown. Okay, when the way forward is unknown. So if you know the solution to the problem that you have, and you're like, I just need to upgrade software from 1.0 to 2.0. You don't need innovation because you know what to do. But when you face a situation where you're like, ooh, that's a new situation, or maybe your boss stands beside you and assigns you to do something that's a new realm, and you don't know what the answer is, then the innovation process is your friend. It can help you through the journey. It also gives you confidence to navigate uncharted waters and step into the unknown. So it's kind of like a, a way to be confident through this ambiguity because the unknown is ambiguous. And so innovation helps you to go into that unknown with confidence because there's a process that you can lean into and you can utilize in your work. And this process can be used for literally anything. The reason why I like this definition of innovation so much, which I made up in Frankenstein uh, with some other ones that I really like, is because innovation can be used for anything. It's not just for, like, I like to say big eye innovation, which is like sending people to space or disrupting big industries and all that. That is innovation, but it can be used in the everyday, in the little eye, in the in our day-to-day -day processes and those types of things. We can use innovation in anything, and it can be used for any industry, any role, any department. And this is what uh, I like to say is the innovation process. So you start with, there's five parts to it, and we'll, we'll unpack this later on. But you start and understand, which is really defining the problem. You go into dream where you're imagining a solution to that problem. You prototype. So you take that idea or solution that you have, and you put it into some sort of form of reality. And then you test that prototype to see if it works or not. You don't know. And if it does and everything goes well, you implement it. And so you really are going through this sort of infinity loop uh, through all these different stages. So we'll get into this in more detail. But I want to now talk about why is innovation needed? And I'll give you five reasons why. First of all, it prepares you for the future. So if you think about what I started this presentation with, it really does. It helps you prepare for that unknown future that's coming to us. And then secondly, it's needed because technology is changing all the time, right? There, we know this in our day and age that there's always new ways of doing things. There's new tech coming out and it gets cheaper and cheaper as time evolves. And technology can disrupt the way we do things today for good or for bad, <laughs> hopefully for good, but it can be for bad. In fact, recently uh, I, have an Adobe, I have Adobe Creative Suite and Adobe is like a designer's platform uh, to use for graphics and so on. And one day I got a message about two weeks ago that said, by the way, there's this thing called type one fonts. So these are all the fonts on your machine. This is being basically sunset in 2023. So if you have these type one fonts on your computer, you can't use them anymore next year. And I'm like, what? I've had these for 20 plus years on my computer. And they're like, well, just contact people and hopefully they can upgrade you and that should be fine. But sometimes technology will disrupt our patterns and we need the ability to innovate to help us stay relevant, which brings me to the next point. Technology helps 
uh, innovation helps us stay relevant to customers because because technology can disrupt what we're doing. Customers can expect new ways of doing things from us, regardless if it's in a different industry that we're in. And I, I always like to provide the example of Amazon. Amazon to me is like the king of convenience of, of brands, right? We Prime back in the day was like, hey, you can buy stuff online and a week later, it'll pop up at your door. And, it, and like, wow, that's great. Wow, I can order something and it just pops up and shows up at my house. And then Prime became a lot faster. It became Prime next day. So instead of a, you know, a couple of days, I'll get it tomorrow. I'm like, wow, that's amazing. And then Prime became same day. So instead of waiting a whole day, now I can just get it the same day. If I order in the morning, get it in the evening. And, and then they had to up it even more. Prime one hour. So now that I can just click a button, it can show up on my doorstep in one hour. And so <laughs> technology changes customer expectations. I've become now somebody that expects things like this. And if I don't see it, I'm like, oh, there's something wrong, right? And I'm going to go to the company that can deliver really, really fast. So we want to be able to stay relevant to our customers in the, in the midst of changing technology. And also, it helps us stay ahead of competitors. So innovation helps us be in front of what our competitors do, because maybe they found a new way of doing something with technology. Maybe they found a new customer model and they're implementing it. And so innovation helps you stay relevant. I worked for State Farm Insurance many, many moons ago, and I was in the innovation space. And it was really interesting because we were trying to propose to State Farm to um, do this, this thing called usage-based insurance, which basically was insuring you for the amount of mileage that you were driving. This was a completely new concept to the organization and to the industry. And uh, you know, at the time, we were a little bit slow to move uh, on that. But then two guys created a company called Metro Mile. And Metro Mile, what, they were basically these two tech geniuses. So they're leveraging technology and they're like, hey, we, we have a way to be able to track your mileage and insure you based on that. So guess what happened? They started uh, popping up uh, all over America. I actually switched my insurance to Metro Mile. Uh, and so they became a threat to State Farm. And so State Farm then so like, ooh, maybe this thing, uh, this technology is probably disrupting us. Our customers are now changing their expectations. Maybe we need to pivot too. And so it's really important, again, for us to innovate in order to stay ahead of our competitors. And last, innovation helps us de-risk the unknown. So I'm going to show you a couple graphs. It actually helps us lower risk when we have a problem that's unknown in front of us. And so I call this uh, a risk investment graph, but let me tell you how this works. So normally when we start a project and we're not sure what the solution is, we, ha we have a high amount of risk, right? Because we've just started something new. So we don't know what we don't know, right? And what you're hoping for during the whole journey is to reduce the amount of risk from really high to really low when you go to implementation, right? Nobody wants to go into the market with lots of risk. That just wouldn't make a lot of sense, right? So you're trying to lower the amount of risk from high to low. And that's what innovation helps with. So conversely, when you start the, this journey of innovation, your investment in whatever the problem is, is super low because you just started it, right? So you haven't spent a lot of time, probably haven't spent a lot of money on it. But what happens during the journey is by the time you get to implementation, that's when you've invested a lot of money. And so what you're really hoping to do is to have the lowest amount of risk possible when your investment is high. And so innovation helps us do that because essentially what we're finding out during the innovation journey is all, all, the, all that risk is being lowered as we find out because we're really trying to solve problems and we're doing testing. So it's a systematic way to lower your risk as your investment uh, goes up. And so that's why it's a really uh, wonderful way to, if you're a risk if you're a risk person or you want to maximize your financial budget innovation will really help you do that. So I want to share you, with you some statistics. So nobody is safe from disruption. 52% uh, of Fortune 500 companies from the year 2000 are extinct. Like just let that settle in. Over half the Fortune 500 companies from just 22 years ago gone. And the average age of a Fortune 500 brand 50 years ago was 61 years. And now it's only 18, less than 18. Like it's, it's, a, it's a shocking statistic. In addition to this, McKinsey & Co. believes that the 75% of the current standard and poor 500 companies will have disappeared by 2027. So all the investments, all the companies that we have our, our stocks and portfolios in, they might not be here in 2027, right? It, there's the, basically, the statistic shows us only a, a quarter, 25% will still be around. 
just like it's it's shocking how disruptive our world is today. And I want to give you some examples too of companies we well we well known. So remember Kodak, right? They were the digital film, they, not the digital. They were the film company. They were from 1889 to 2012, and they were the world's largest film company. And they could not keep up with the digital revolution. They actually held back from developing their digital cameras because they were in fear of it taking over their film business. And guess what? In 2012, they filed for bankruptcy. You may not know this, but Kodak was actually the first company to create the digital camera. So they actually had the ability to be a market leader in the industry, but they were afraid that it would cannibalize their sales. And because of that, Kodak is now a slide that I'm talking to you about today. What about Blockbuster? So they had a good run from 1985 to 2010. At its peak, Blockbuster had more than 84,000 people worldwide and over 9,000 stores. And they filed for bankruptcy in 2010. So if you didn't know this, in the year 2000, Netflix actually offered to sell their company to Blockbuster for $50 million. And the Blockbuster CEO was not interested because it was a very niche market. And then at the time, they were losing money. So Blockbuster, just like Kodak, had the opportunity <laughs> to move with uh, technology and move with customers. And again, it's on another slide I'm sharing with you today. All right, let's talk about taxis. When's the last time you took a taxi? Been a really long time for me. But in 2014, a New York taxi medallion, which was the right to own or permit or the right to drive a taxi in New York City, was worth over a million dollars. And by June of 2018, it had dropped to $170,000. Like that's a staggering statistic. By November 2021, it dropped to as low as $25,000. Right. So you had something that had a net value of over a million to drop to as low as I don't know what the math is, but a lot less uh, in seven years. And and just to see, show you how ride hailing became a thing in the first quarter of 2014, a ride hailing was about eight percent of business travel ground transportation in the market. Rental cars were 55. Taxis were 37. Four years later. Q1 of 2018, ride hailing now had grabbed 70.5% of the market. Rental cars going down to 23.5 and taxis just six, right? So you can see like the entire taxi industry was disrupted and we know this. Uh, I remember I was in, a, I think I was in Austin and at the time they didn't have ride hailing up and running. And I remember I was frustrated that I had to find a taxi. Like I remember myself and I was just, it was so interesting because that was normally the form of transportation. But in just a few years, my, my own self, I was looking, I was like, oh, I'm like, I have to find a taxi. Like, what is this? Like, why can't I get it on my app? Right. So my, my preferences as a customer changed because of ride hailing. And, and that was like literally the last time I took a taxi because I, I only use ride hailing per personally. Uh, and so the reality is that you either disrupt or you be disrupted. And the choice is up to you. Okay, so let's talk about what innovators do. I'm curious in the chat if you would, would you tell me, what do you think innovators do? Can you throw that in the chat? What do innovators do? <laughs> Disrupt anyone else. Yeah, nice. Yes. Look for solutions, dream big, solve problems faster. Great possibilities. Imagine these are these are lovely responses. Yes, yes to all these things. Yes. Think about how to improve. No answer. Throw spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. <laughs> nice. More efficiency. Add a new twist to something. This is beautiful. These are great. Challenge the status quo. Uh, I would like to propose to you that they see and create a new future. So if you go back to the definition that I offered, innovation is creating a new future. This is what innovators do. Right, They're able to see a different possibility and then create that new possibility by bringing that into reality. So these are some of their attributes. So I believe that innovators are open-minded, right? So they're open to all sorts of different things, all sorts of possibilities. They are highly curious people. So these are people that ask tons of questions, right? They're always like, oh, what about this? Oh, what, have you thought about that? They're always asking you questions. It might be a little bit too much for you, but they're really, really curious people. I am like that too. I have millions of questions. I'm asking them all the time. 
they are experimenters and tinkerers. So they like to try things and figure it out. Uh, David said, throw spaghetti spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks, right? You're, you're willing to get in there and see, will this work? Will it not? I don't know. Let's let's try it. Let's tinker with it, right? And there's and because of that, they're willing to take risks. It's okay if it doesn't work, you know, and if it fails, that's okay. They're willing to try. They're, they dare to try to see if it'll work or not. Innovators are problem solvers. We saw a lot in the chat there too, right? They like to solve problems. They're not, they're trying to fix things that, you know, they see issues with and they're trying to bring a new reality. They are collaborators. They know that they can't do it on their own uh, only. And so they seek out other people to collaborate with them, to, to get the power of the, the other people's perspectives and bring that in. They are observers. So they notice things. They see things maybe that we all see, but they really are able to pay attention and find different nuances that maybe everyone else doesn't. They're also visionaries, right? They're able to see that new future, right? So they can dream of new possibilities of what could be. Uh, they're also creative people, uh, of course, right? Because they can they have new ideas and creativity is about ideas. And lastly, they're resilient. So if they see a vision, they're going to make the thing happen, right? They're not just going to let it die on the vine. If even if they get told no or whatever it is, they're they're going to they're going to push. They're they're going to try their best to uh, see what happens and push through that to see that dream come to reality. So, how about you? Here's another poll for you, and I'd love to know what of these characteristics that you have. Uh, again, there's no right or wrong. So, Shauna, if you can throw that up. Uh, this is a multiple choice uh, kind of not a multiple multiple select. So, if you have more than one, feel free to click more. But how about you? What type of these characteristics do you have? Seeing a nice mix, a lot of, a lot of curious people. I, I can see this, so you'll see it on the back end, but uh, a lot of curious people. That's a great trait to have, great trait to have. I'm gonna give you maybe, maybe 15 more seconds, Sean, and then we'll, close it up and move on but uh looks like we got a lot of curious people i love that all right so it looks like curiosity is one of the highest uh highest results and then open-minded and experimentation and problem solving in observe observation these are great i love this all right so let's move on who then can innovate now i want to ask you a question Dramatic pause. <laughs> Click the wrong thing. <laughs> Have you ever created a new future by transforming an idea into value? I just want you to answer this in your mind. You can write it in the chat if you like. You can write yes uh, if you want. Uh, but have you ever created a new future by transforming an idea into value? And if you have answered yes to this, then I will tell you, you have innovated. Uh, so congratulations. You have done innovation and you are a innovator. Okay. And that's what I want to tell you. Everybody can be an innovator. This is like the best news, uh, truly. Uh, any, everybody can be an innovator. It is not reserved only for the Elon Musks and the Jeff Bezos of the world, right? It's people sending people into space or disrupting industries and all those things. Anyone can be an innovator. And the way you can become an innovator is by learning innovation thinking, so the mindsets of innovation, and innovation doing, skill sets. It's just like anything else. Anybody can learn what uh, how to be an innovator. It's a learnable, buildable skill that all of y'all can learn. Okay. All right. So uh, I'm not going to ask you this, but we're going to talk about challenges to innovation. Uh, I'm just going to tell you because I think I'm running out of time a little bit. I get too excited when I'm talking. So let's talk through some challenges to innovation. So research shows that 75% of companies say innovation is a priority which there's a lot of companies saying that this is important to us. However, only 20% of companies are actually ready and equipped to actually innovate, right? So there's a huge discrepancy. 75% of people are like, we need this thing, but only 20% of those actually feel like, hey, I can do this thing, right? And so, so why? Why is there this disconnect? I'd like to propose to you some challenges that get in the way of us innovating. And so... Well, I'll break these down in more detail, but there's some internal challenges. There's four. There's more than this, but this is what I'll go over today. Uh, and then some external factors. So let's go through the internal factors first. So first of all, it's just a lack of knowledge, right? Just like the other slide said, you know, I just, I'm not ready and equipped because I don't know how, 
right? So without knowing how to innovate, you can't innovate. It's kind of kind of straightforward, right? But it's again, it's something that we can be taught. And so uh, if you have a lack of knowledge, if you're taught, you can learn how to innovate. Then we also have this thing called the amygdala and it's in our brain and change is seen as a threat to our amygdala. And the amygdala is our fight flight response center in our brain. So when our brain sees a threat, it will see it like a bear and it has two responses. You're going to fight it, which I don't recommend against a bear or a flight, and you're going to run. But also, <laughs> I've been told it's not a good for a thing for a bear, but you're, you're basically resisting it, right? And the thing is, is change is scary and it's unknown. It's uncomfortable. And so when we're faced with change, our brain wants to protect itself. It just literally doesn't like change, right? And <laughs> so it resists, it resists it. So we have an internal mechanism that resists change. We also have what I call the expert brain and expert brain is great, right? We, we all are good at the things that we do. We're subject matter experts. And while it's helpful, the problem with our expert brain is that it can narrow down our possibilities and it can restrict what we're, we're able to see um, because we get stuck from our own perspective and our, own, our past experiences. And, and we're, we're trapped into what are called rivers of thinking. So you think of rivers, you, you can't really jump out of a river. It's, it goes where it goes, right? And so sometimes our, our expert brain will restrict the possibilities of what could be. And, and it gets in our way of innovation. And then fourthly, we could have a lack of psychological safety internally. So I like to always ask people, like, how safe are you in your own mind? Do you fight your own thoughts, right? So if you're if there's a new way of thinking about something, you're like, oh, that's a dumb idea. Oh, no, that's not going to work, right? Do you resist them? Do you even shut them down before there's even a chance for it to leave your mouth to share it with somebody else? I have done this a lot. Uh, I'd be like, oh, how about, oh, that's not a good idea. Oh, I don't want to share that one, mm -mm. right? And so we can have an internal lack of psychological safety in ourselves to not be able to, and be willing to explore because maybe our amygdala is like, ooh, I don't know about that one, Leo, just, just keep it quiet. And so we shut it down internally. Okay, so those are four internal factors. What about external factors? So first of all, it's a lack of time. In order to innovate, you need time to innovate, right? If you're constantly at or over capacity, it's hard to see new opportunities. When I when I worked at State Farm Innovation, um, my boss told me, if you're ever at 80% or more in terms of capacity, you have to let me know. And I'm going to shift things off your calendar. I'm going to take workload off of you. Like I worked in innovation full time. And my boss still told me, <laughs> if you're at 80% or more, you let me know and I will give you more margin to think. I'm like, I'm thinking, I'm thinking about innovation, my full-time job, but yet still, I still need this margin. And it's a really, really important thing to consider. If you're too busy, ideas will not visit you. Okay, so Elizabeth Gilbert, she's an author of Eat, Pray, Love. She's really known, really famous for that book. And she had this, this uh, concept that, like ideas will visit you. Uh, and if you're too busy, <laughs> they're just going to go right by because they don't have a space to land in your brain. And they would, in fact, they'll go to somebody else. So we need the ability to pause to innovate, right? Some of you said that you're an observer. We need time to observe. We need time to be curious, right? And so we really uh, need time to innovate. Externally, also, you could have a lack of support. So maybe uh, your boss doesn't want you to innovate or somebody's telling you, uh, let's just keep it how it is. Let's just leave it alone. We don't want to disrupt anything. It's just fine the way it is. That's the amygdala, by the way. Uh, so we could just lack permission. We can also uh, lack the resources. Maybe, you know, we might think, oh, I need a lot of money to innovate or whatever. I need I mean money to do what it is. So we might lack the permission and resources. We also work in functional silos. So many organizations have these. And the problem with silos is that we're separated, right? The right hand does not know what the left hand is doing. And it really takes a, a huge amount of intentionality to work beyond them. And it's really, uh, I believe truly that collaboration drives innovation. And without it, it's hard to innovate, right? Again, if you go back to our expert brain, it's hard to see outside of our lens, our perspective. And so without the ability to collaborate because of functional silos, uh, you know, it prevents us from really innovating. I had a functional, si so when I was at State Farm Innovation, we had very distinct teams. I was on the front on the front end of innovation. I was a team called Strategic Foresight. There was a team in the middle called um, Concept Development and a back end team called Go to Market. I had no idea what those other two teams did, like ever. And so, even in an innovation organization at the time, we struggled with 
having functional silos, even in an innovation organization. So it really does take intentionality for us to work beyond these if we see this as, uh, as a problem. We also have past successes, right? We know this phrase very well. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? Uh, and so companies actually become established because they do something well. And they're literally set up to keep the bus running, right? Companies form because they do something amazing in the world. And then the business structures are set up to support whatever that is that they're doing, right? So, but the problem is, is that this can lead uh, to a resistance to change because it's uncomfortable. It's like, well, this is working really great. Our, our profits are increasing all the time. Why would we change that? If it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? But innovation is change and it disrupts the status quo. So sometimes the past success of our organization can actually prevent us from actually having a desire to innovate. It creates this like inner resistance towards it. And then lastly, going back to the other uh, internal interior um, internal barrier is a lack of psychological safety organizationally. So how safe is your organizational culture when it comes to sharing new ideas and thoughts, right? Are you able to share your thoughts freely without any judgment or shame? Can you truly express your ideas? Do you feel like you can take thought or idea risks? And unfortunately for a lot of organizations, the answer to this is no. Maybe they're in pockets where you feel safe, but overall, you know, you 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 could be told like, oh, that was the worst idea I ever heard. Like, oh, don't say that one again, right? Or like, oh, well, I know 5,000 reasons why what you just said will not work. Like, why did you even say that, right? And so if we have a lack of uh, outward psychological safety, that shuts us down even more. So you can see that there are a lot of challenges, really, that get into the way of innovation. So how do we overcome these challenges? I'd like to propose to you that it's simple. It's just learning how to become an innovator. And what I said earlier is that innovation is a teachable mindset and skill set that anyone can learn. So learn innovation thinking and learn innovation doing. So in innovation thinking, these are things that personally I think are really important for uh, us to consider as we lean into innovation, right? Psychological safety, having a beginner's mindset, curiosity, associative thinking, collaboration, being bold, uh, something I call prototype thinking and creative resilience. I don't have the time to talk about all these things, um, but these are ways in which we can start nurturing uh, ourselves as innovators and get past these challenges that we face. And then externally, uh, I mean, on the skill set and doing side, it's really around like, how do you innovate? So when we go through the, the, the innovation process, you know, learning all the things, like how do you define a problem well? How do you figure out what the, the, the root cause of that problem is? What are research techniques? What are, uh, how do you brainstorm and have effective ideation? You know, what, how about creativity? How do we develop more creativity? How do we learn to prototype? These are all things that you can learn. And the beautiful thing is it's a journey. So like anything, uh, you can learn this uh, to be innovative. You can learn to become an innovator. And, oh, and during this journey, there's going to be some great times and there's going to be some not so great times. But that's why we need resilience is to push through, right? We see a vision that we want to happen and we're going to move through it. And, and through this journey, you will gain confidence over time. Innovation, just like anything else, again, is a learnable, buildable skill. So, you know, even something as simple as riding a bicycle, when we first started riding a bicycle, it's really anxious, right? Like I, I was a terrible first bike rider. I had training wheels. I, I think I fell off lots of times, but over time I gained confidence and then I didn't need my training wheels anymore, right? And so that's just the same with innovation. Over time, you'll gain confidence. All right. So Let's talk, now I've talked a lot of theory. Let's talk about how to innovate, okay? Like, Leo, tell me how. Okay, so this is the process. I'm gonna dive into it uh, sort of in detail because we just don't have the time today to go through all the things. But we're gonna start with understand. So what is understand all about? It's understanding the problem to solve. So there's always a problem to solve and we really want to thoroughly understand the, all the things about it. And really high level, the way you do that is first defining the audience. So who does this problem that you're trying to solve for affect, right? Or who are the people that this problem affects? You want to define that. You want to understand them. And what you're really trying to figure out is their pain points, their frustrations, the, the things that really irk and bug them. You really want to uncover all the, the things about what that is. And you do that by conducting research. Uh, don't worry, it's not, a, not too much of a scary word, but you're really, research can be just talking to people and just uh, understanding from their point of view what that is. So you, you, you figure out, okay, here are the people that this problem affects, and then you uncover all their pain points around it, right, through research. And once you've done that, you want to examine uh, the data that you find out. So what did all this research tell me? What, what am I now seeing 
from these people that I'm trying to solve this problem for. And uh, understand is a uh, is not the favorite part of the innovation journey for many people. <laughs> and people often find that it's, uh, it takes a lot of time and hard work. And it does. It's true. It does. But it's really important to do this stage well, because, you know, if we were all going on a road trip together, would you rather get to the destination you want to go to or just miss it by a little bit? Like, let's just say we're driving 1500 kilometers somewhere. Would you be okay if we missed it by 150 kilometers because our coordinates were off? Right. So we want to do this well to ensure that the problem we're solving for is really a problem that actually exists and it actually affects a real person or, or, or group of audience people. Um, Albert Einstein is famously known for a quote, and he said this, if I had a pro, if I had an hour to solve a problem, I would spend 55 minutes defining the problem and five minutes coming up with a solution. So like that's a huge percent of ratio uh, associated with defining the problem and just a little bit solving for it. So we really want to make sure we do due diligence here to make sure we start off on the right journey. Like our North Star is North. We know the problem is a problem that affects a certain person. We know that it means something to them if we solve for it and all that kind of stuff. And so spending the right amount of time here is really important. So you go slow at the start to go fast at the end. That's how understand really works. Uh, and I'll give you a tool for this uh, after I go through this part. Okay, the next part is my favorite is dream. And this is probably for a lot of people. Just create ideas, right? Solving the problem. Remember, it says solve the problem here. So you actually need to know what the problem is and not just dreaming just for fun. Uh, and so dreaming is where you're creating lots of ideas. You're ideating. So you're you're generating all sorts of things. Uh, you know, sky's the limit. You know, you can dream of possibilities. It's my favorite part because this is a part where, hey, it might not exist yet. And you now get that the the ability to create a new future. I think this part is so fun because nobody could tell you can't do it uh, yet, right? Because we don't know. We just want to explore what all the possibilities are to create uh, you know, create ideas to solve this problem. But then after you create lots of ideas, you got to, you can't do all of them, right? So you got to evaluate, you got to bring them, you got to pare them down in order to move forward. So there's, a, there's this, uh, there's this process of expanding and checking out all the things and then an evaluation process where you're really just bringing it into focus. Uh, and so this is a time when you want to bring in people like me, uh, to your sessions because I think that everything's possible and it's just it's lots of fun. I gain energy doing this. This is not true for everybody, but for me it is. And so this really allows you to dream of all the possibilities. And it's always better to push the edges and go further than you think because people will always bring you back in, right? And it's a lot harder to go uh, to go really broad when you've been told like, this is, okay, I want your ideas to fit in this little box and that's all it can be. So you want to push the edges as much as you can here. And there's a lot of tools that you can utilize uh, to help you dream. All right, so after you dream, you want to prototype. So this is really putting a form to your to an idea that you have, right? So I like to always say that understand and dream are a bit more cerebral. It's a bit more in our brains, right? You're 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 defining a problem and then you have an idea for it. But when you get to prototype, that's really where the rubber meets the road. That's really when people now have an ability to react to something that you are hoping to see get rolled out, right? Uh, and so, you know, prototype doesn't necessarily need to be like a physical widget, like a like a thing. It could be like a, a napkin sketch or whatever. But you want to develop a prototype to help communicate what your idea is. So there's a we know the famous quote that uh, a wor uh, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? Uh, IDEO once said that a prototype is worth a thousand meetings. So, uh, and the reason why is because when you actually get to see something and you can react to it and you can interact with it, it actually answers a lot of questions and it helps clarify for people what you're trying to say. Uh, I had the pleasure of interviewing a Lego designer. Uh, if you have the Lego Orchid, it's the same guy. His name, his name is Mike Saki, Psyche. And uh, I had the pleasure of interviewing him one time and we were having this conversation about prototyping and he had told me that, um, you know, he used to think he was an excellent communicator. So like he could really articulate his things really well. And what he started finding for himself was when he was pitching ideas to Lego, uh, he realized that prototyping it actually was the best way to communicate his idea. And so he was like, I, forget me just trying to tell you things. He's like, I'm just going to prototype the build that I hope that Lego wants to take. And, and he told me that like that changed everything for him, like save him lots of time. People understood him more. He's like, I don't even try to say anything anymore. I just build the thing and be like, look, this is what the thing I want. Uh, and so that's why prototyping is really important. And 
you want to consider the resolution of your prototype when you build these things. And so resolution is uh, how... Uh, for lack of better terms, how, how realistic it looks like. A lot of times we think that a prototype actually has to fully function. So if we were designing like a mobile application, as an example, oh, I have to have the graphics, I got to be able to click stuff and it moves me to the next screen and then the back end's working and it's you're checking out or whatever it is. And we think that it has to be a fully functioning thing. Where in most cases, you're just trying to see if people like the concept or you know does the sequence of things make sense? So you can actually in this mobile example, you could draw them on napkins and be like, hey, I, I want to develop this mobile application. What do you think? And just show people and be like, oh, yeah. Oh, you don't like that? OK, great. Uh, and so lower resolution actually gets you a lot further than you think. And low resolution means it's cheap to make. It's quick and dirty. Uh, it, think about what a napkin sketch versus a full mobile application in terms of resolution, right? What is suitable for you to communicate the idea that you're trying to convey and, and know that you're going to improve this over time? So once you develop a prototype, you want to test it because you don't know if it's going to work or not. So you want to test to gain insight and improve it. So testing means I'm going to take the thing that I built, I'm going to put it in front of the audience, and I'm going to be like, hey, does this solve the problem that I identified with you? Does this meet your needs? You know, And, and then I give it to them and then listen for feedback. And when I get their feedback, then I analyze what they say, and I go back to prototype. I make a new one, I make some changes or adjustments to the prototype, and then I go to test again. So between prototype and test, there's this huge iterative cycle where we're going back and forth. Maybe the prototype was a bad prototype, maybe I gotta go back to dream. So you're constantly learning in this cyclical way. This is why it's an iterative process. You're learning and you're going and testing and, and going from there. All right, and so iteration truly is the key here. You're gonna go back and forth. And what you're really trying to do is here, you're reducing a lot of risk, right? Because when we first put out a thing, we don't know if it's gonna work or not. So we go to test to be able to see all the things that we weren't sure of. And then finally, hopefully we go to implement, right? We wanna make the finished solution a reality. So the way we do this is we plan it out, right? What are all the things that we need to do? Who do we need to talk to? Who are the stakeholders, all that? And then we deliver it, right? We we follow the action plan and we go out and get it out there into the world. And it uh, and so then we complete a cycle of the innovation journey. Uh, most most people I find don't have a really a problem with the back end of innovation, which is the test and Im implementation. We hire a lot of doers that know how to get things done. It's the front end of innovation, the, the understand dream and prototype where it's a lot fuzzier. And so a lot more clarity is needed on that front end in the experiences that I've had to teach people how to do that fuzzy stuff. I like the fuzzy stuff personally. I think it's fun. Uh, but th that's where a lot of people need help with. Implementation, like people are pretty good with this. Like you tell me to do something, I got you. I got you. I, I got to go. All right. So let's talk now about how to innovate with a tool. And I, I can, I'm going to give you one and we're going to give you a little practice. So... This will be uh, friendly to the observers in the room. It's it's observation. Observation is one of the, my most favorite research techniques because anybody can do it anywhere. It's like the most low-hanging fruit research technique that you can use. And what it allows you to do is to uncover pain points from the target audience that you're trying to serve. And it's a really, really powerful tool that you can use. When I first found out about observation, uh, when I was taught observation, uh, the first activity that they made me do was sit, uh, this was at State Farm, so I sat in a lobby and I observed people walk through security doors. Uh, yeah, I sat, I sat on a bench, I brought a notebook with me and I watched people go through security doors. And it was actually pretty interesting. Uh, yeah, I know, it sounds weird, right? But it was actually pretty interesting because what I noticed was People would like, they would walk really fast. They get to the door and it, the door was super slow. So they would literally stand with their feet pretty much touching the door. And then they, you know, once, once they get up, they're, you know, right back to up to speed. And everybody did this. Uh, and so it was a really interesting way for me to uncover a pain point, which was like probably the security door could move a little faster because everybody's doing the same pattern, same behavior. Um, and observation is really powerful too, also because unfortunately, we as humans don't always say what actually happens. So if you were to ask a customer a question, they might not actually do what they said. And they're not trying to lie to you. They just are missing something uh, in their brains. And I'm going to give you a quick story. Uh, there are these two researchers that were trying to understand um, how an elderly woman, uh, if she had any difficulty opening a prescription bottle. So they were actually in her home. And they're like, hey, do you have problems opening a prescription bottle? She's like, oh, no, no, I'm, no, no problems here. And they're like, really? Like, so they're kind of like, can you show us how you do that? She's like, yeah, sure. 
come with me to the kitchen. They're like, sure. So they follow her into the kitchen and she had one of those meat slicing things, you know, the ones that ch chop the sandwich meat. So she like, you know, takes her prescription bottle, puts it there and went, Whoa. and then off goes, off goes the cap. And they're like, oh my, that's not what you said. You, just, you said there was, you had no issue. She's like, I don't have any issues with opening my prescription bottle. I have my meat cutting thing. And right. And so that's why observation is so powerful because Sometimes people just kind of, you know, they might not even see it as a problem. And this is called an adaptation. Sometimes when we have problems in our life, we have these little hack arounds to fix it. And so the problem actually isn't a problem for us anymore because we've solved it with some sort of, you know, like duct tape, right? Or whatever it is, like zip ties. Like we figured out a way around it, but it's still actually a problem. It's just that no longer, there's no longer a way that really bugs us. But observation is a really powerful way to uncover this. And all you need to do is determine something you want to observe. You go there and I would recommend you bring like a book or something to record your notes. You sit there and you watch and you just observe what's going on. You try to be inconspicuous. You don't want people to really notice you while you're there because you want to observe them in their natural setting to see what's going on. And you just watch and you take notes. And if you see, if you feel so bold, you can do what's called an intercept where if they do something, you could be like, hey, I just noticed you did whatever. Would you mind if I ask you a few questions? And then you can use that to gain a lot of insight from whatever it is that you're observing. So I want to give you a, a quick try. I want you to, to try your observation power. So those observers in the room, there are 14 of you, uh, I see. Uh, I want to see how what you notice. I'm going to show you a photo on the next slide, and I want you to try this. So I want you to think about, like, what do you see? What do you notice? What questions come up for you as you look at this photo? Are there things you're more curious to know, abort, mo know more about? And what do you think this person enjoys? Okay, so... As you're watching, you can take some notes. I'm going to give you a few minutes to do this. I want you to see what you observe in the next photo. Okay, so here it is. This is a photo. What do you observe? I'm going to give you make a couple minutes just to notate what you see here. So what comes up for you here? What do you think this person likes doing? Or things that you see that you're like, huh, I wonder why that's there. I want to ask this person some more about that. What do you see? I love that you're throwing that in the chat. That's great. Yeah, do that. Please. Gamer, curious to live here, mix of children stuff, adult, teenage, really old gaming system. Nice. Do they ever use the door? Free rug, plush, soft environment, workout equipment's pushed in the corner and blocked off. What's in the garbage bag? Yeah. All right, let me ask you another question. What what do you think this person likes? Likes to do? What are what are their interests or their hobbies or passions? What do you think? Someone says movies, games. Anime. Working out. Exercise. Staying cool, collecting stuffed animals, entertainment and exercise, then came kids. Yep. Tasks that require step water. Nice. <laughs> Y'all are observing lots of things here. I like it. Room is not finished quite yet. Remote organizers wants to be organized, but can't quite get there. I feel you. It's really tidy. Nice. Excellent. Okay. These are great observations. Is there anything else you're curious about in the room that you see? You're like, anything else that you're noticing? Fuzzy things. I see a bookshelf. Why is there no wireless console? Why the workout equipment is inaccessible? <laughs> These are great. Okay. DVD shelf. Why the stuffies? Okay. So you, you already are all sharing out. Uh, Last time I did this, somebody noticed the speakers and they have said, this person must be really into audio because there's a pretty significant um, sound setup here. All right. So this person is me. 
uh, if you didn't guess. <laughs> uh, I have no kids. I'm the I'm the adult kid. Uh, and uh, I love stuffed animals, which is why there's lots of them. I love anything furry and fuzzy and cute, which is why there's lots of cute stuff. They're actually all over this office that it's blurred behind me that you don't see. Uh, <laughs> what a twist. Uh, I am. I love games. So I, I, I like new, old, all the things in between. I'm an Apple person. So you can see there's an Apple laptop just above the monkey head. Uh, I don't actually remember what's in the garbage bag, by the way. I am a kind of a messy person. So somebody picked up on that. Like I try, but it mm, doesn't really work for me too much. Uh, and so I do my best. Uh, maybe the ladder is there in the garbage bags for my workout stuff because I want to work out, but maybe I don't really want to. Uh, maybe there's an insight there. Um, but I, I hope what you see, take from this exercise is that you gain a lot of insight. And, right, and we just needed a bit of time to look at this. Right? Think about this with your customers, doing it at work, observing somebody going through a problem that you're trying to solve for. And you, the amount of insight that you can get is incredible. It really is. We just did this for five minutes, right? And you're only looking at a photo. Imagine you were there in 3D, you can hear the sounds, you can observe more how they interact with people, all those types of things. This is really honestly one of the best techniques that you can use to understand people's uh, pains that they face, their problems that they face every day, because you can you see so much. And then you have the ability to talk to them, uh, if you feel so bold, to understand a little bit more about who that person person is. Um, oh, yeah, by the way, I do like movies and I'm a sound person. That's why I have big speakers because I like really good sound. Uh, too. So, OK, so that's hopefully you got some uh, so got something out of that exercise. But let's just recap. So what we talked today, we talked about what is innovation, right? We I said that it's it's creating a new future by transforming ideas into value, uh, why it's needed. We talked about five things, why it's needed. We talked about what do innovators do and what they do is they create and see a new future, right? Who can innovate? That's all of you. That's me too. Uh, all of us can innovate. There are challenges that get in uh, the way when we innovate. So we have those uh, internal challenges as well as external challenges. And then I shared with you a process of innovation. So understand, dream, prototype, test, and implement. And then lastly, we just covered observation as one tool. There are m There's much more down this rabbit hole uh, to go down, um, but hopefully you found this helpful. So I just want to close with this is that the best way to prepare for the future is to create it. Innovation helps you create a new future. And last, how today will you create a new future? So I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Uh, you can, uh, yeah, so that's me. My email is leo at aboundinnovation.ca. Uh, my social is at Leo Nelson Chan. So I do post actually a lot on LinkedIn and on Instagram about innovation stuff. So I like to post articles and things I'm thinking about to help inspire innovation. So thank you so much for your time. And if you have any takeaways or questions, please let me know. I do have a newsletter that I send out about once a month. So if you'd like to sign up, you can scan the QR code there or go to that uh, bit.ly link. But uh, yeah, time for all the questions. Yeah, what questions do you have? Love to love to see uh, what you have. And I'd love to know what your takeaways are. So if you wanna throw that in the chat, let me know, like, what did you take away from this? What's what what's meaningful to you today? What what stands out for you? What are yeah, you taking? Um, I'll just jump in and say, as you can probably see, everyone has loved your presentation. So <laughs> lots of great feedback for you there. Um, and yes, keep keep sharing your feedback. Um, I'm going to be reading out some questions from the Q&A. Um, continue to type questions if you have them. If you'd like to raise your hand instead and, and voice something uh, to Leo, then please do. And I, I can have that uh, adapted so that you can talk. Uh, but Leo, I'll just start with uh, a Q&A here. Uh, there's a little context before the question. So um, not a lot of safety in this person's workplace. They ask for forgiveness rather than permission. Reactions to my innovation comes in the form of you did what? That's incredible from execs and you need to run it by me first from middle management. When I have, my innovation has been shut down. Other than mm. get out, how can you innovate around toxic leadership? Mm. It's a good question. Um, I, I, <laughs> I, I would suggest that sometimes when we innovate, um, it it makes other people uncomfortable. And if we go back to thinking about that, it disrupts things. Sometimes they say no to us, not because they disagree with the idea or think it's valuable. It's actually just because they, they have a resistance to change. And it might be the way we communicate an idea to them might not be in the way that they need, 
right? So we all have different ways of communication. And so if we go back to like the concept of prototyping, maybe if I'm trying to come with you with like a cerebral idea, like, hey, I have an idea for this, right? And I'm sharing it with somebody, what they might need is a prototype, because they might have all this uncertainty around what I'm sharing, what I'm sharing, and they might be resisting out of that uh, versus, you know, maybe they need to see it, like, I need actually a tangible way to see it. Um, when I, when I've been resisted in the corporate realm, <laughs> I did it anyway, uh, on the back end. And so I remember I would always, pre you know, pre present new ideas and new thinking to, it wasn't just my leadership, but just even other colleagues. And they would tell me no, for whatever reason, and be like, ah, I don't think so. I would be so passionate about that thing. So when we go back to the resilience as a uh, innovator, potential uh, quality, I would still do it anyway on the back end. But what I did was I actually made a prototype. So I'm like, I want to show you a working model. So I went a bit on the higher resolution, but like, I want to show you a working model of how this thing could be. And whenever I showed it to people, they're like, oh, that's cool. That saves me time. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. Right. But they would tell me no eventually. And so I think it's really learning and being empathetic towards why the no and even asking them like if they resist you sometimes it's not because they don't think it's a valuable thing they might just have a different reason and so it's actually a pretty good thing to do is just ask like can I ask you why you said no and see what they say and they still do it and you still feel really passionate about it do it anyway and figure out a way to do it that helps the organization right and we think about we're serving our organizations and we're, we want to give more time back or whatever it is that's innovation to me is a way. And so I, I can't see any management not agreeing with a way to save time, save money, same resource dollars, same budget. If you found a better way to do something that's more effective and you can demonstrate the value, then I would say try to do it that way. <laughs> Hopefully that answers the question. Thanks, Leo. Yeah. A few more questions for you here. Um, you might have spoke to this a little bit, but what's the difference between innovation and play? Ooh, uh, I think there's a lot that that the words are really extremely similar. Um, uh, pl play to me helps you have an innovative mindset because play puts you into a world of experimentation, of trying new things, of multiple possibilities, of there not having to be a, one right or wrong way. And to me, innovation is also those things too. So I think play can actually help you enter into an innovation, like into the right mindsets. And in fact, when you're stuck, play is a way to help break past barriers because that's what you're doing in play. You know, even playing like doing something like ping pong or something, something kinesthetic, like it actually puts you in the right mental mindset. So I think innovation and play have a lot to do with each other. Uh, and I think play is a really powerful way to step into innovation. So uh, I don't see them that different. I mean, play play can be just for fun sake. So I mean, innovation is a bit more targeted in terms of trying to add value in your organization. But I think play can really enhance innovation uh, in, in terms of the mindsets and helping you get unstuck if needed. So you know, next time you're you're banging your head against the wall, go go do something playful, like and see how that can free your mind. Um, actually. I'll, I'll use one example. I, I like to play games. You saw you saw that in my uh, in my slide, right? I like to play games, and I remember I was playing this one game where I got fixated onto one solution only. Uh, I thought there was only one way to solve the, the challenge that I was in, and then I realized that I could just look at a different perspective and do it another way. Uh, and actually, that was a really helpful innovation mindset, and it's a story I will tell in a workshop eventually. Um, but it put me into a right mindset of like, hey, there's actually more than one possibility. It just doesn't have to be the same thing. And so I think play is a sort of a soft way into some of these difficult challenges that we face. It's a really powerful tool. Uh, and, and also, I think if you, if you see like a group of uh, adults or employees that are struggling to, to innovate, get them to start playing with it, even use a word like, why don't we play with this idea? Let's try it out, right? To encourage that behavior that you're looking for. I think it's a really great way to, to tie them together. I love that. Thanks, Leo. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what are some leading indicators of a lack of innovation in a company? Hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I think a lot of it can do with mindsets or things that you're hearing. So uh, like I personally believe psychological safety is a foundation for innovation. So if you feel like you're getting a lot of pushback, resistance, people saying, oh, that's not going to work because, oh, we've tried that one, like a, a like a closed mindedness, you know, oh, wh why would you change that? You know, hey, we're good. Like, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If you start sensing those things, I, I think you're going to sense a lot of resistance. I mean, and again, another barrier is just time, right? If, if your organization is so busy, like all your staff are overworked and 
over capacity and you're just barely swimming and just trying to, you know, tread water. I mean, that's a dangerous sign that your organization doesn't have the ability to truly innovate because you're just too busy. And, and interestingly enough, I find that innovation actually is a way to create margin for yourself, right? Because there's always a bet, whatever you're doing today, there's probably a better way to do it. And, and if you can innovate that, you can actually create margin for yourself and give you the time that you actually want. So innovation can actually create the margin that you're looking for uh, in your space. So I would say those are some of the barriers. And, and also, like we can also think that we need permission from our leadership to innovate. And sometimes we don't. Sometimes we there, there's actually more in our own agency and over what we control that we could, probably could do without, you know, being blessed by the top uh, and and actually being able to change things and, and create margin for ourselves. So, you know, look around at what you do and there might actually be ways you can innovate in your own role without, you know, getting formal permission from anybody. Great. Um, wondering if you could speak a little on how innovation plays a role in digital media. I know you talked about this already, but maybe just add a little bit to that. Did you, uh, I probably need a bit more clarity in terms of what exactly for digital media. Yeah, um, there was a couple of questions around it. One of them was around um, examples of innovation as it relates to the digital transformation of SMEs internal ecosystems. Does that help you? <laughs> hmm. If the question asking could provide a little more context, I'd love to unpack that a little more. Yeah, I only have what I have in front of me, so I can move to the next question if you like. <laughs> okay, yeah. Maybe the question <laughs> um, asked you can throw it in the chat. Give me some more context. Yes, of course. Um, as well, you mentioned some of the tools to get started. Um, just wondering if there's a tool you can recommend for a small team to get started um, on innovating together. Yeah. Um, well, I would tell you to understand first. <laughs> I would tell you to start doing observation. Um, but maybe if you're thinking about it in the lens of brainstorming, uh, I like to use the word ideation. So if you've heard me say these two words, brainstorming is like we just get together and so just seeing what sticks like, hey, let's brainstorm on this topic, whatever. Ideation is when there's an actual problem you're solving for and you want to create ideas against that problem. Uh, so just going to tell you that difference. But one of my favorite tools is I, I kind of made it up. I kind of borrowed it from someone, but then added Leo's twist on it. So I call it worst idea ever. And um, so basically what happens when we ever, when we come together as groups and we want to dream up of a new future, a lot of us in turn, you're like, Ooh, I don't want to be the person that like says the really bad idea. Right? Like nobody wants to do that. Like, Oh, that was dumb. Leo. <laughs> like, why'd you say that? So this exercise gets it all out of the way first. So it makes it fun. So the way it works is, let's say whatever the problem you're solving for, you list out literally the worst ideas you could conceive of for that problem. So if let's just say we're thinking about like, how do we offer better training to our employees? As an example, what are the worst ideas you literally can think of to train your ideas? As an example, I could say you should punch everyone in the face every time uh, you teach them something new. Just give them a little bop on the nose, you know, try to make it bleed. That's a pretty terrible idea, right? And so you're really trying to, and people really should laugh because you're trying to go like really absurd. So think illegally, think uh, things you would get fired for, think things that you'd get sent to HR for, uh, <laughs> things that maybe make you go to jail, all that kind of don't worry, we're not actually doing any of them, but you're just using that to frame about like how to get into that kind of mindset, you know, really crazy ideas, silly things. And once you come up with a really good list of things, what you want to ask is what are the, the complete opposites of the things we just created for? So if I were to say like we punch them in the face, what, what would be something that's different than that? Maybe there's a way that I can impact your heart every time we train that you feel good about it, you know? So you, you take the opposite of the really terrible ideas and then you can come up with some really creative solutions. And to me, this is a really way to truly think outside the box because you wouldn't consider doing these really <laughs> illegal things, dangerous things, things you get fired for, all those types of things. And you actually get fresh thinking into your meeting. Um, one time I led that particular exercise with a, with a team. And so somebody said, like, we should all do drugs. So I'm like, cool. Okay. Like, we just went straight there. That's great. Perfect. Right. Gave them a high five. And the, I can't, I really, really wish I remember the opposite, but the opposite was the idea that the team moved forward with of that one. Uh, and it just shows like you can think so differently about things. You can use inspiration from anywhere. So I think that's a really powerful tool. 
Uh, I call it worst idea ever. Uh, and honestly, you should laugh. And the, the really nice thing is when we laugh, it actually lowers, like it lowers our cortisol. It helps us bond with our team. It reduces the pressure and overwhelm of coming up with the best idea. And it also reduces the pressure of coming up with the worst idea and you being the person because we all did it together. Uh, and so I love actually starting sessions with that tool, particularly because it does so many things uh, to get you in the right mindset and you get really cool ideas from it. So that's a really great one for, uh, for Dream. That you can use. I have a lot of questions for you. Um, if anyone else is typing, please keep typing and, and send your question in. Um, but otherwise, I'll turn it over to Mickey to, to do some follow up here. Yeah, I don't have much to, to, to follow up with you. I mean, thank you so much, Leo. I can't believe it. All the comments and the things happening in the chat are fantastic. Um, it was a really great session, and I think you've inspired us all. I think somebody even wrote in the chat what I've been thinking. I think I now understand. Like I've always been an observer. I love sitting there and watching people, but now I'm going to watch for what I can make better or where the gap is or what's happening around me more than just just watching the people. I think that observation thing is, is pretty, pretty big. Uh, anyway, I just want to say thank you so much, um, Leo, for you uh, joining us today, of course, for Leo. Uh, thank you so much. I really, um, if anybody wants to connect, uh, then you can reach out to Shauna or myself through Innovation Guelph or Leo left uh, his contact information up for a long time too. So feel free to reach out directly. Um, sign up for the newsletter. Hope you all scanned your QR code as well. Um, but we'll be following up with you by the end of the week with a copy of the video of this presentation and a special uh, handout that Leo has presented for you uh, and you'll get that by the end of the week. So feedback form is in the chat. Uh, please fill it out before you disappear for the afternoon or just leave it open and fill it out later. We'll uh, share your comments with Leo but as well it gives us an understanding of what it is you like and what it is you want to see. So uh, we'll do that. If there's anything you want to see us present uh, on one of these Toolkit Tuesdays, please do share that with us. So just a really big Quick thank you to um, everyone here on the call today. Samantha, Shelley, uh, thank you so much uh, to our sponsors, to Shauna, to Adelaide, who's been in the background. Uh, thank you so much to all of you, and have a really great afternoon, and come back again. Take care. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Lots of applause. <laughs>